Shalom, shalom, chavrim. Welcome to Treasured Inheritance Ministry. It is myself, Aliyah, and today we are going to be sharing around Yeshua's word. It's going to be such a nice time that we're going to be having together today. And I really wanted to share uh, more of a message with you than anything else today. Of course, it's not going to be about going into Mary's life, but it's I've done teachings on Mary before, but it's really, really a message today that I really want to share with you and that Abba Father really quick into my heart and so I want to just welcome you into the space that we can hear our father's rich beautiful graceful encouraging voice a voice that we often need to hear in our lives and I don't know about you but this year has been really hard as well and I know for many many people that I've been meeting this year has had so many challenges and so today I want to welcome you into the space as we talk about Mary and her alabaster jar and what this really means and how we can really see this and how our father wants to just share his word with us today and so before we get into this let us just close our eyes and just settle our hearts may we experience the stillness of Yeshua's Holy Spirit and may we just come to a place of prayer together so father we just thank you so much that you are a great God and awesome King we commit this time that we have today father we commit it to you father this time that we have together around your word father let your will be done let your word be shared let it speak into our hearts refresh our spirit spirits touch our souls touch our minds today with your word father with your word of truth and your spirit of shalom and comfort and we just commit this time to you yeshua in your mighty mighty name we pray amen so like i said welcome welcome and you know yeshua really quickened me some time ago to the story of mary and her extravagant gift of worship when she anointed Yeshua, the savior of all all of us, you know, for generations and generations, Yeshua has always been the savior. And Mary stepped in, Mary of Bethany stepped in at an incredible moment in time. And I wanted to share a message with you today. Before I get into touching on the scripture where we find this incredible story, I want to say firstly that This anointing of Yeshua that was done by Mary of Bethany that we're going to be touching on today in John 12 must not be confused with the earlier anointing of Yeshua that was retold in Luke chapter 8. And if you don't know, there are actually two stories of woman anointing Yeshua. And the first time when we see in Luke chapter 8, Yeshua was anointed by an unnamed woman who was referred to in the gospels as a sinner that anointed Yeshua and so three gospels actually uh, namely I'm going to say Matthew, John and Mark all document that incident however John's account actually is the one that we're going to be focusing on and let me say that again because it might be a little bit confusing we have an unnamed woman who was a sinner who came and anointed Yeshua but Matthew John and Mark all document this incident meaning the one that we're going to be talking about today Mary of Bethany she was not the unnamed sinner who anointed Yeshua before his death instead she was a righteous woman that Yeshua knew very well Yeshua was a lot of times on many different occasions throughout the Gospels in Mary, Martha and Lazarus house. They were siblings and they lived together. And you can also see this in my teaching that I did, a teaching called What's Wrong With Being Martha? You can go and have a look at that on our channel. And also I've done a teaching on Mary of Bethany, all separate, how deeply Yeshua knew and loved both Mary, Martha, and of course, Lazarus, their brother, whom he raised from the dead. You know, oftentimes when we approach the scripture, we just see these, you know, stories in kind of isolation from each other. But when we weave that thread through, we will see Yeshua was often with Mary and Martha. He, he was in their home a lot. He knew Mary really well. It wasn't just that one moment that we focus so much on where she was sitting at the feet of Yeshua. But there's many moments where we see Mary and Martha, through, you know, with Yeshua many times at the raising of their brother Lazarus. We see them again. But here it comes into focus, John 12 verse 1 to 11, this incredible moment where Mary of Bethany comes 
to Yeshua. And what she does was quite incredible. Six days before the Passover, Yeshua came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Yeshua had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Yeshua's honor and Martha served in the beautiful way that Martha always does whenever we see her in the scriptures. While Lazarus, he was among those that were reclining at the table with Yeshua. So he was enjoying the presence of Yeshua and the supper with Yeshua. Then Mary, who was their sister obviously, took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it out on Yeshua's feet and she wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Now, he did not say that because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Yeshua replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Yeshua was there and they came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. Crazy. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Yeshua and believing in him. Which kind of makes sense, I guess, because Lazarus, whose name actually in the original is Eliezer, he was raised from the dead. I mean, he was literally dead for a few days and he was raised. So obviously many people were getting saved because of him. But, you know, this scene that we have here, it kind of makes people sometimes a little bit uncomfortable because think about it like this. And, and the reason I say it makes people uncomfortable is because there's different, you know, people see things differently, women's hair and women's dress and the way that women worship, you know, the way that we worship Yeshua and whom he has called us to be is so incredibly free. And Yeshua is reclining in a safe place. He's in the home of his beloved friends and disciples. He's with Lazarus. He's with Martha. He's with Mary. He's with probably the, well, definitely he was with the 12 disciples, but also probably the woman that followed him around that we hear about in Luke chapter eight, Mary Magdalene, you know, Mary, his mother could have been there. There were many people that were there. And while he's sitting at the table among his disciples and a large crowd, other people that maybe whose names we don't even know about, but did follow Yeshua, and possibly it could have been very much a large male audience that was there. But into this reality walks Mary of Bethany. You know, I kind of feel so emotional when I imagine, can you just imagine the scene? She walks in to a crowd of people. Yes, this is her home, but this is a very different environment. A lot of people have gathered to see Yeshua. Because he raised Lazarus from the dead. They've also come to see Lazarus. There's a lot of people there that believe in Yeshua. But there's also a lot of people who don't believe in Yeshua. They are curious. And, and there are some that are maybe truth seekers. That are curious to seek the truth. And that is why they are there. And then there are others like we hear about the Jews that came. And, and members of the scribes and the Pharisees that are there. And they're all looking at firstly who Yeshua is. And they know the rumors about him. They've questioned him so many times. This is only six days before his death. He's been with the people many times, performing many miracles. The enemies of Yeshua are there. They're trying to catch him out. They're trying to see who his followers are. And if you are part of his following crowd, your life could also typically be in danger. You know, people, it's a very, very crazy situation because Yeshua is the Messiah and we believe that about him but you know while he was walking on the earth there were so many rumors and names that he was called and things that he that he did that were incredible lives that were touched but also truth that divided people and it's a it's a crowd of people who are gathering to see this man and then there are others that have already accepted him and into all of this and like I said, could be a larger male audience as well. Into all of this walks Mary of Bethany. This takes so much courage and so much strength. But also, I believe that she could do it because her eyes were focused on one person. And that was Yeshua. In she walks. She loosens her hair. And this is what makes some people uncomfortable. 
because they're like, oh, you know, a woman's here and it needs to be tied up and it needs to be hidden. And, you know, if that was the case and that was a true biblical context, and I know that it might upset some of your theology, hopefully, you know, you've, you've far past this. But, you know, if that was the case, then what Mary did would have been seen as quite a bad act, but it wasn't. It was a beautiful act. It is the one of worship. She loosened her hair. She took out this extravagant box of what was called spikenard. And she began to anoint Yeshua's feet. The other gospels that I mentioned, particularly Matthew and Mark, they actually tell us that she anointed his head as well. The whole amount of perfume that Mary used was roughly, we know today, about 34 kilograms. Wow, that is so much. It was worth a whole year's wages for a common person. So she definitely did anoint Yeshua's head and his feet as well. It's a, it's this, it's, it's not just a story and we can't just see it as a story. It happened. It really, really happened. And the question is, what is this all about? When we look at this, we can have a textbook answer because Yeshua answers the question himself. I believe that not only Judas, it's, it's safe to say that not only Judas Iscariot was probably upset about this extra, extravagant worship. And again, like we know, it wasn't because he cared about anything. There's jealousy and there's, you know, lies and there's, there's these feelings in people's hearts towards Yeshua that they are wanting these kind of situations to happen so that they can accuse him of things things that are not true. And so this is that moment, you know, what Mary did also created a moment where people could pinpoint and point a finger at Yeshua and see, hey, you know, like, wow, you letting people do this to you, you letting someone anoint you, you letting a single woman anoint your feet and your head, even they must have gossiped about what Mary did. But this was a beautiful act of worship. The simple answer is, yes, she saved the perfume for the day of Yeshua's burial. But there is so, so much more. Mary entered the scene with this alabaster box or jar, as it appears in the scripture. And it was filled with this expensive perfume, this nard, as it was called. Now, the alabaster jar was really the beautiful carved jar and it was well known in the ancient world carried spices carried oil in new testament times certain individuals were actually anointed with this oil and the spices from an alabaster jar and usually this was probably more for the elite and we need to, to be real about that you know this is not something that just ordinary people would have access to so it also reveals that mary martha and lazarus were elite and, and quite well well established financially and so you know this was something that was done for very special people that they were anointed with this oil anointed with these spices and they were embalmed and placed into a tomb this is what would happen and Yeshua tells these gasping disciples that this act of self-sacrificial love by Mary was ordained from the beginning of time now imagine that Mary herself was acting out of love for Yeshua. Her rare act of service and her self-sacrificial love was actually in fact ordained for her to fulfill in the story of Yeshua's life. I find that quite incredible because Yeshua says over and over again, he's saying here that leave her alone because this was destined. This was meant to happen. You know, I love the fact that when you see Yeshua and, and we need to have that door thrown open onto him and his life. When you see Yeshua, not only sitting at tables or visiting people's homes, but when you see him walking through the streets, when you see him teaching, when you see him with his disciples, when you see him, you know, going to the stake, when you see him resurrected, when you see him and, and that first moment of resurrection, what do these moments all have in common that Yeshua is surrounded by the woman he loved, his female followers, his female disciples, we always say it and it is so true. Analyzing the life of Yeshua reveals how powerfully Yeshua empowered the woman around him. The woman at the well, this longest dialogue that he has with someone recorded throughout the 
all of the gospels is with a woman and that's the woman at the well in John chapter 4. We see these acts of love and truth the moment where Yeshua is walking through this little village and sees a mother weeping behind her dead son. Yeshua's heart is so moved that he raises her son from the dead and restores her child back to her. That is what Yeshua did in Luke chapter 8. He calls female disciples to himself. We have Mary Magdalene, Joanna and Shoshana and they're with him. When we see Yeshua on the stake at the end of his physical life before his resurrection, before he goes into the tomb for three days and three nights, who do we see standing by the stake of Yeshua risking their lives to be standing there? The woman who followed him around again Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Shoshana, Mary the mother of Yeshua, his auntie and other women that were there. When we see Yeshua at his resurrection and he comes out of the tomb, who's the first person he reveals himself to? Miriam of Magdala. And he says to her and gives her that first apostolic call after his resurrection, says, you go and tell my brothers that I'm alive. Go and tell them to meet me in the Galilee. He gives her the first apostolic call. When we have the Holy Spirit poured out in Acts chapter 2 in the upper room, who do we see there? But it says Yeshua's female followers as well as his mother and many of the women that followed him. Yeshua elevated women and women were so part of his ministry and they were so part of his life because he loves us as women and he loves his female followers and his female disciples. Mary's act, yes, was ordained for her to follow, to, to, to fulfill, sorry, but you know what? She could do it because she was a follower of Yeshua. Her act was one of complete love. It was devotion. It was an act of becoming a servant. Every time you see Mary, Mary of Bethany, you see her in a sitting position. She's always at the feet of Yeshua. Yeshua appears again, this time with an act of humility, an act of pouring it all out, not just from the jar, yes, of the jar, but from herself in order to show her devotion to the king. Yes, there would have been maybe even rumors about her going around after she's, you know, washing his feet with her hair. But you know what? She didn't care because she was devoted to him. This is what true discipleship looks like. It's what true servants of the king do. They pour it all out. And I'm not talking about coming and asking for forgiveness. You know, that was a separate occasion where this woman came and she wept on Yeshua's feet asking forgiveness and he forgave her. Mary's gift was so different. It was about walking a road and living a life of cost for the king of kings. Mary's gift cost her in so many ways. She was laying down. And like I said, sh sure, they could probably afford this gift. But still, a gift like this is expensive. And if you're doing it, you know that you're doing it because you're laying it down before Yeshua. It's lavish. It's lavish love and it's lavish love at the feet of the king. And it's incredible that, you know, Mary washed her master's feet, but she washed his feet with the most expensive thing that maybe she even possessed. Maybe she even had, you know, it was about, yes, I'm, I'm being a servant, but I'm also being a disciple. But yet there's something deeper that's happening here. You know, on a personal level, when I read the story of the alabaster jar many, many years ago, there's a song that I'm sure you love and that I love so much by C.C. Winans. And it's a song that every time, not every time, but a lot of times when I go to conferences here in Cape Town and I'm sharing the word during the worship, it happened just a month ago. During the worship, people will sing the song. It's such a special song to so many people. And here in Cape Town, people love this song. And no one forgets the CC one and song about the alabaster jar. And a couple of years ago, the song was really, really important to me. About eight years ago, while I was going through a time of illness and a time of hardship in my life. And Yeshua really, you know, was consistently teaching me about this alabaster jar. And... 
I one day decided that I would go in search of a jar, which I could use for a talk because I was going to be preaching a sermon and I wanted to use the alabaster jar. And physical objects are really great because they get us into the feel of the story. And I walked around the shop looking at different jars, but I didn't leave with anyone because I just really didn't feel connected to anyone when I got home I made a cup of tea and I sat down with Yeshua and I started praying about this alabaster jar I kind of felt that there was a revelation that the father kept wanting to share with me but he wanted me to go on the journey he wanted me to look wanted me to feel he wanted me to experience he wanted me to talk he wanted me to question and it was a very deep moment for me when I sat down and I suddenly heard the voice of Yeshua say very clearly to me, my child, that your heart is the alabaster jar. It was a very deep moment for me because it came with a huge spiritual revelation. And I knew as well that Yeshua was not just saying it to me, but he was also saying it for the body collectively. I have learned that the only way our hearts can become alabaster jars is if our hearts themselves are sanctified for special use to the king. They need our hearts to be made pure and beautiful and holy. You see, Mary wouldn't have offered anything less to Yeshua on that day. And I've also learned that the oil spikenard, that special oil that was in Mary's alabaster jar, actually the symbol of it and the stand standing of it is the fragrance of intimate love. When intimate love and self-sacrifice fill our hearts, when devotion, surrender, and self-denial can characterize every heartbeat and whisper of our souls, and we can give it and pour it all out on Yeshua, that's what we need to do. Many true followers of Yeshua, and, and I might be speaking to you today, you might be one of these people. You've walked your road at a very high price. The price is called counting the cost. It's sometimes called yielding. And you know, I've also learned that our wounds of deepest pain, the wounds of the rejection we've had, or the fear that we have, or the grief, the abandonment, the gossip, or the abuse, or all of the woundedness inside of our hearts are part of this jar. It's part of what we bring to Yeshua. You know, when it comes to wounds, we have two options, don't we? We can firstly allow the wounds of our hearts and the pains of this life to cause our souls and spirits to become wicked or bitter. You know, we can call it can cause our hearts to become dead or not alive anymore or jealous or filled with gossip or filled with bitterness where we look at other people and we expect them to do certain things or be certain ways, but we judge and, and we hold on to forms of legalism and impure religion and we hold on to all these things and and we actually silently without knowing enter a state of death and darkness or when we have wounds or when we have pain or when we go through the hardships and it's very difficult but we can yield this to the loving power of our savior who is greater than our pain because he promises to be with us in it he doesn't often promise to take the pain away but he does say that i will be with you because i'm the god of comfort i'm the god of life and he wants to touch us again with reviving life inside of us and we know that this type of healing is sometimes costly because it forces us to be real with who we are and to be real with what really is truth you know if you feel a certain emotion and I encourage you to do this you know modern day psychology we we call it self-awareness but this is the kind of thing that we should be practicing every day we need to be self-aware in other words we need to be aware if you feel a feeling say towards someone or you're sitting on social media and someone posts something and you feel jealous, the, the, the thing that you should be doing in that moment is to stop. Yes, you know, uh, switch that social media off, go on, switch it off. And then sit there and ask Yeshua, why do I feel this way towards what I've just seen? Or why do I feel despair or disappointment? Why do I feel pain or hurt? Why do I feel this way? And don't you know, push your feelings aside because that's actually a trauma response. Yeshua is the safe hands and he's, he's the one that comes to be beside us. He is the safe place for us to say, why do I feel this way? And when we can question and say, why do I feel this way? We, bega- we can begin to seek the answers. Oftentimes, if we see something on social media and we feel maybe jealous or 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 sad, it is because there's something inside of our hearts that's still pain and it's okay. But we need to pour that out with Yeshua. 
you know, and, and that, that is part of what this means. Yeshua never wants you and me to pretend. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to fall apart and it's okay to be pain. It's okay to still have grief. It's okay to be still mourning for loved ones that have been lost. You know, it's okay to have these feelings. It's okay to be in despair. And I want to tell you something else deeper still, and this might be for you. It's okay to be angry too. It's okay sometimes to to be real with yourself. I want to say that, you know, sometimes we feel angry as people towards Yahweh. Sometimes we feel disappointed by God or we wonder because we've been through a hard time and and was Yeshua really there? We doubt. This is built into our human experience. Yahweh created us from the dust of the earth. And these experiences that we have, pain, and grief and you know despair and discouragement sometimes doubt it's built into us as human beings Yahweh doesn't condemn us for it and we don't disappoint him when we feel these things and instead the freeing reality is that Yeshua knew Yeshua knew that we would experience all of this because that's how it is because that is our human experience you know one of the most comforting things for me is the fact that when I read the Bible and Lazarus is dead and Yeshua comes there after a couple of days and Yeshua is 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 standing there and Lazarus is is really stinky in the tomb (laughs) they don't even want to roll that rock away when Yeshua says roll it away because they're like Yeshua he has been in there while he is stinky you don't want to roll that rock away one of the most encouraging scriptures for me is the scripture that says and it's the shortest one in the entire bible it says Yeshua wept. It is by far the most encouraging, comforting scripture that I've needed on my hardest days. Because Yeshua knew Lazarus would resurrect. And he knew that it was going to be used for the glory of Yahweh. But still, Yeshua experienced every single thing that it means to be human. He experienced the sadness of what it means when we lose a loved one. And this year... Yosef and I have lost two of our loved ones dearest to our hearts and it has been hard and it has been painful and there's so many tears that have been cried that are being cried and that will be cried. In this I remember Yeshua wept regardless of the fact that these our loved ones are with him now and there is always that hope of seeing those we love again. It's not our reality yet. And so therefore we cry and we weep and and we pain. And yet it is that kind of costly fragrance that we healed to him too. Because at the feet of Yeshua, we can bring all of our suffering. We can bring every single thing. We can bring the tears that fill up our jars, that fill up our hearts. Our tears are prayers. They are prayers to Yahweh. And actually it says that he gathers them in a bottle and not one is lost. To deepen this reality, I want us to take a quick look at Psalm 84 and particularly verse 5 and 6. And it says the following, Blessed, happy, fortunate, to be envied is the man or is the person whose strength is in you, whose heart are the highways, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of weeping, in Hebrew called Baca, they make it a place of springs, and the early rain also fills the pools with blessings. Now, join your attention to verse 6. It says, those who pass through the valley of weeping. If you read it in the Psalms, it says the valley of Baca, and actually that's what it will say in our English Bibles, but it actually means the valley of weeping. But they make it a pool of springs filled with blessings. Look at this. No, this does not mean that, oh, you must get over your tears and just pretend to be okay. It doesn't mean that, oh, because someone died that you loved, you're suddenly going to be blessed. It doesn't mean that. It means this paradoxical thing that in human thinking, it, it just seems so, you know, so different from each other. We're crying and we're weeping here, but yet there's a blessing. In, in the spiritual thought, it does make sense because sometimes we have to walk through a place of weeping and it's literally a valley and a place of weeping. The message of our individual valleys of tears is that we weep in pain in brokenness often and Yeshua allows our woundedness our desperation and everything that's inside of us to pour forth because that place of valley that is in us 
can become a place of deeper intimacy and wholeness in our relationship with Yeshua. I have come to the point of reality and yes, I've been saved for two, over two decades and maybe you listening you saved less or you saved more but we need to realize that we are human beings and life is a complex reality the reality is though that as much as what we've tried to figure things out in our minds or we try and plot our lives the the plain reality is that intimacy with Yeshua is the only thing that is going to lead us through the hardest times, through the deepest pains. And it's, it's, it's that place with him, that deep intimacy that leads us forth. There are no words to describe that process. There's no words to describe that place. What I can tell you, if there's any form of pride, any form of self-righteousness, any pursuit of power or position, those things cannot enter the domain of yielding and sacrificial worship and love with Yeshua. Because Judas reacted with anger, he reacted with pride. Pride. His words, you know, they really seem good on the outside, but don't many people. I'm sure you've met many people like that too. But there's only a different kind of message in his heart. And, you know, Mary, she is the true disciple of Yeshua. She's not one of the 12. Sure, it doesn't matter because she was one of the disciples of Yeshua. She gave all of herself from everything, all of herself to the king. Judas sat there wondering what he could get out of it, you know. He used to steal from the money bag. He was thinking, what can he get out of this? But you know what? Mary didn't ever think what she could get out of it. It was never ever about what can I get from Yeshua. It was about what can I give. And here is how it looks. A true disciple is not about themselves. They're not about the title or the fanfare. They're not about any of that. They count the cost of what it takes to walk the walk and throw it all at the feet of the master. And it's necessary sometimes. And and I want to encourage you to lean in to the valley of tears and weeping because Mary did. I think she was ridiculed for loving Yeshua. She was probably misunderstood for loving Yeshua, for always wanting to be by his feet. We see three glimpses of her really spoken about in the Gospels. One is when she was sitting by the feet of Yeshua and Martha complained. The second was when Mary went to meet Yeshua at her brother's death, at his, at his tomb. And here's the third time where Mary is pouring out this expensive nod on Yeshua's feet. I do not for one moment believe that these are the only times Yeshua spent with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, but it is what we have documented. Mary was an incredible person, and I'm sure that many people were also shocked at her sacrifice. And it probably seemed a little bit crazy for a woman to perform such a strange act, but it was what she was called to do. Think about Think about Mary, it's every time we see her, she is just at Yeshua's feet and she was destined to be there. And I can tell you this, that all the truly sincere followers of Messiah Yeshua will be labeled exactly the same because they are willing to do what no person has done before and to go where no person has ever gone either. You know, to be the, the one of sacrificial love. Let people call you crazy for the love that you have for him. Let people call you crazy for weeping in front of him let people call you crazy when you seek healing for your woundedness with him let people call you crazy when you dance with exuberant joy at festivals and occasions and bible study groups let them call you crazy who cares Yeshua is the one that we keep our eyes on just like Esther kept her eyes towards the king Mary kept her eyes on Yeshua and that's what counted. To end off, I want to say this, that throughout the gospel accounts of Yeshua and the thousands of lives he touched and ministered to, I want to tell you this, that there are only four people in the entire gospels who are specifically called the ones Yeshua loved using those words. Now we know Yeshua loves all of us and loved everyone that he was with, but there are four people only that the gospels document as the ones Yeshua loved. Now they are John, we know the beloved disciple who leaned on Yeshua's breast and then surprise, surprise, or maybe not so much a surprise. John 11 verse five says, Yeshua loved Martha, her sister Mary and Lazarus. We make such a big deal about Peter and about John and about all these other people. But how do we skip over 
the fact that Yeshua loved Martha, her sister Mary, and Lazarus, and is documented for us in the Word of God. How do we skip over the fact that these three people were probably the closest family Yeshua probably experienced, that they were the ones that he loved? He was probably in their house all the time. Do you want to be known as someone whom Yeshua loves? Imagine having your name in the Bible and says Yeshua loved. The truth of the matter is your name is in there because Yeshua died for all of us and he loves all of us. You know, do you want to be known as a disciple whose insides also reflect what's on the outside? That the worship you give on the outside with maybe your hands or your mouth or your time or your feet or whatever you do is reflecting what's inside of you. It matters more that Yeshua loves us then what we can bring, what we can do. People are often seeking for their purpose and purpose is very important. And and I, I want to say this because it's a reminder to all of us. Purpose is so important. But what really matters is that we live in Yeshua's love. We love him and we can be blessed by the fact that he loves us. Do you know that Yeshua also wants to love on you? Sometimes we focus so much on what we can bring to Yeshua, on what we can do for Yeshua, on, you know, getting into a place of praise and worship and praising him and bringing blessings to his heart. Do you know that he also likes to love on you, that he also wants to just spend time with you and just wants to sometimes just speak over you and wants to just draw close to you, just wants to sit near you. He also wants us to feel his delight in us. You know, in the Bible, it says that, Yahweh delights in you and he sings his song over you and he makes music about you. So tune your ears, your spiritual ears to hear his songs and to feel his delight in you too. Because truthfully, he also wants to love on you and have you feel how much he delights in you because that brings resurrection life. You know, Mary's sacrifice is a message for every single season. Uh, we Yes, we've been through the festivals now and these are special times where we know that it was about drawing near to him. Here down in the southern hemisphere, we are in springtime and it's that joyful time of the year when the winter goes and life begins again and you see your plants and your, your you know trees budding forth and it's really exciting. But you know... It's also just a a moment that is for every single season. We need to pour it all out to be filled up again. Walk in, pour it all out. Mary's gift was ordained for that time of history. She made history. She wrote history by the fact that she wasn't seeking to write it. She wasn't seeking to do anything else but be the person who loved Yeshua from a sacrificial heart. And it's a beautiful, beautiful message, a beautiful picture, a beautiful gift that she gave, not only to Yeshua, but also to us as her sisters. And now I want to end off really with saying tonight that, you know what, women, as I said, throughout this teaching, they played a huge role in the life and the flow of Yeshua's ministry. And, I, and I, I cannot state that enough because women keep on discrediting and discounting themselves and stepping back and going, no, that's not for me because I'm a woman. Or no, that's not for me because that's for my husband. Or that's not for me because I'm not married. Or that's not for me because, you know what, nothing is not for you. Whatever is ordained for you in your life, whatever Yeshua has for you. It is what he has for you. A woman was used by Yahweh to bring Yeshua into the world. There was no man involved with that. Woman provided for Yeshua's ministry here on earth. In Luke 8, we read it. Women were called faithful apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and workers in the kingdom. We've had female prophetesses since the beginning of the Old Testament. We have a prophetic role to play in the end time drama that's going to usher in the king. Psalm 68 verse 11 says that. Yahweh sent forth his word and great is the army of women who proclaim it. We are called to be women warriors of this earth and we have to join the army. Mary joined the army of Yeshua as a true servant and a true follower, laying her heart devotion 
out there for everyone to see in a sacrificial act of love that was ordained for her to fulfill at a unique point in time that caused her to be ridiculed and misunderstood by so many people, not just Judas Iscariot, but it didn't really matter to her because all she knew was that she loved Yeshua and she would do whatever it took at whatever cost and she gave every single thing and it didn't matter what it looked like and it didn't matter how much it cost her in the physical, but you know what? It was all about the fact that Yeshua is the love of my life and I will do anything to show him my my devotion. You know, there are things ordained for you to fulfill in your life, written about from the beginning of time, just like it was ordained for Mary to fulfill, as Yeshua proclaimed it on that day, six days before his death, was ordained for her to proclaim this truth that Yeshua was going to die. And, and you know, she was anointing him for that death, even before other people understood it. There are things that you need to fulfill in your life that have been written about for you by Yeshua from the beginning of time and I'm encouraging you today to fulfill it. Stop discounting yourself. Stop discrediting yourself. Stop saying you don't have what it takes. Stop doubting yourself. Don't allow the despair of the past to grip you. Don't allow the moments of pain and woundedness or the things that people have said or the gossip, whatever it may be, whatever it's about, don't allow that to hold your heart captive to unseen chains and invisible lies because that is what binds us. It binds us and then we do not fulfill the things that Yeshua ordained for us and we want to fulfill it because of our great extravagant love for him and him alone. And so today, let us say together, Father, let your will be done in us can we anoint you with all that we are be with our hearts as they pain today if our hearts are in pain father we pray that you will be with our hearts in their pain father as our hearts are turning over with things that maybe we don't understand or hardships that we are currently going through and but father we pray today that you will come and comfort our hearts that you will be the god of comfort and that you will return us to a place where the valleys of weeping father will become a place of refreshing springs and pools of life and blessing we pray that that father you will be with us when it is hard that when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death that, Father, we will feel no fear, no fear of evil. But, Father, that we will be able to say what it says, that only goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell with Yahweh. I will dwell with Him forever and ever. Yeshua, I pray that you will draw us closer as a true follower, as a true disciple, as a kingdom person with a kingdom mindset and a kingdom heart. Help us, Father, just not experience the pull that we so sometimes feel the pull of this world father you know there's so many opposing forces at work in this earth right now we pray that you'll protect us from it all protect us from being culturally minded with the culture of this day but help us be true disciples that are conformed to your image now sure i pray today that the person listening to me right now that Abba Father you will come in afresh that you will remove all forces of darkness in the mighty name of Yeshua Father from them and that you will just anoint my dear sister again Father with your truth with your love with your, your explosive energy with your power with your joy with your peace and with your grace and comfort with joy and strength in in abundance father and i pray that each one of us will fulfill the destiny father that you created us to fulfill in this time period in this earth father at this time father we thank you so much for this time that we have been together we thank you that you are good that you are holy and that you are awesome father you say be glorified in our midst be glorified in our hearts and lead us and guide us so that we can truly be like mary was on time, in step, and absolutely devoted. Yeshua, we pray this in your mighty name alone. Amen. I want to say thank you so much for joining me today. And I know Yeshua has met with us. And I know that our hearts are refreshed again. And so I pray that you'll be absolutely blessed as you continue to go about your day. Do not forget to subscribe to our channel, the channel that you are on, Treasured Inheritance Ministry. And also go on over to the website treasuredinheritanceministry.com for written teachings and updates and all sorts of things that you can find there. And until next time, it's been such a great joy, such a great blessing. May Yeshua 
bless you, keep you, and make his glorious, amazing face to shine upon you and bless you with his shalom. Until next time, take care and Yahweh bless. Mm-hmm.